Well, uh, thank you for joining us. Welcome to Grace. As we continue our journey through the Bible today, uh, let's pick it up where we left off in our last session with uh, talking about the prophet Daniel and how Daniel interpret, and interpreted that dream that King Nebuchadnezzar kept having over and over again. Uh, as you recall, only Daniel was able to describe to the king the image that the king kept seeing. It was an imposing image uh, with the various parts of that image depicting um, standing for the various kings and nations that the prophet Jeremiah spoke of earlier when he made this prophetic statement concerning the nation Israel in Jeremiah chapter 25 verse 14. You'll recall this, uh, this statement of Jeremiah here and it's not on there but that's all right. For many nations and great kings shall serve themselves of them of Israel also and I'll repay those nations meaning um, he's going to recompense them according to their deeds and according to the works of their own hands. Uh, so from time to time, um, we see that even back in history, God did indeed uh, punish Babylon, for instance, the head of the figure. Um, but they didn't get the full punishment. That's to come down the road. They got a taste of what was coming. Uh, and from the time of Israel's captivity forward, there would be various Gentile powers uh, serving themselves by serving themselves, serving themselves of Israel by serving themselves of the land that God had given to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And as we noted earlier, the removal of Israel from the land uh, through the Assyrian and Babylonian captivities marked only the beginning, only the initial pouring out of Israel's fifth and final bucket of wrath. Uh, they were promised that bucket of wrath back in Leviticus chapter 26, uh, beginning. Um, uh, up earlier and that they were promised first the blessings and then the cursings that would come if and when really when they failed to keep that contract as they had sworn they could keep it faithfully and consistently um, the only way that Israel could escape the wrath sitting in this all of the buckets but especially this fifth and final bucket of wrath was for the people and that would include the leadership of the nation to make what I've called their law failure confession God called upon them to make back in Leviticus chapter 26 beginning with verse 40. Uh, since God was dealing with Israel on a national basis, nothing short of a national confession would do the trick when it came to them becoming that peculiar nation above all nations and gaining their land. But the nation failed to make that law failure confession. Instead, they turned their backs on the Most High God, the God of their fathers, and bucket of wrath number five began to spill out its contents on Israel and on Judah. According to the image in King Nebuchadnezzar's dream, the first kingdom to serve itself of the nation Israel by serving themselves of the land in connection with his fifth bucket of wrath was the kingdom known as the Babylonian kingdom uh, or empire. Although Babylonian or Babylon rather was the first component of the image of King Nebuchadnezzar's dream, the Babylonian empire was not the first kingdom to give the Israelites problems in the land. The Assyrians had been demonstrating their opposition to Israel prior to the land being ruled over by the Babylonians. It's just that when King Nebuchadnezzar had this dream, it was the Babylonian Empire that was in power, uh, having, having defeated the Assyrians. So we're going to see, as we begin to later on identify the ten toes, and we'll do that probably in next week's message, hopefully, um, we'll see that it's the same people groups. Uh, yes, it's, it's down the line. It's the down line, so to speak, from the Assyrians who uh, were serving themselves of Israel from the beginning. So it's the same people groups. Those ten toes will be in time future. All right, a quick look at, at the map of the Assyrian Empire shows the, um, shows the Assyrian influence and the power in the land, uh, their power, the Assyrian power in the land prior to the rise of the Babylonian Empire. But keep in mind, it's the same land. Nothing's changed land-wise, it's just who's in power in the land. Keep in mind that while the fifth bucket of wrath began to fall during the reign of King Nebuchadnezzar, the Assyrians had always been problematic for Israel. Um, and that was true before the fifth bucket of wrath began to fall. What I want you to notice is that regardless of the ruling power that's in place, the land is always the core issue. Uh, when it comes to this fifth and final bucket of wrath in the nation serving themselves of Israel. The land is the core issue when it comes to Israel's uh, national confession, their law failure confession. Uh, the Babylonian Empire was simply the next empire in line, the next ruling power to come along after the, uh, the Assyrian Empire had already played its course. And, and the, the, the Babylonian Empire 
uh, ruled over the land that had been given to Abraham. So the Babylonian kingdom was the first kingdom to serve itself of Israel's land as far as the image of King Nebuchadnezzar was concerned. That's why we don't see the Assyrians listed as a beast, but they were indeed. After the Babylonian kingdom came the Medo-Persian kingdom. But the issue continued to be the rightful rulership of that land that God had given to Abram. Abram to Abraham and to Abraham's seed, namely the offspring of Jacob or we might say Israel. The Medo-Persian Empire was the third governmental power group serving itself by, uh, of Israel by serving itself of Israel's land. Assyrians, then Babylonians, and now the Medo-Persian Empire. And that land is known as God's house, and we know why it's particularly important to God. Uh, because it, in his repossession of the earthly realm, uh, that land is going to be where he returns, where Christ returns and, and rules and reigns on the earth. The Medo-Persian Empire then gave way to Alexander the Great's Grecian Empire, which was divided into four sections by Alexander's four generals after Alexander's death, and we know he died a very early death at the age of 29. Only two of those generals were involved with the land that God had given to Israel, thus the two thighs of the image in King Nebuchadnezzar's dream. Uh, those two thighs of brass representing the Ptolemaic dynasty, as we described it, and the Seleucid dynasty, a series of kings to come from those two families. But once again, in each case, you can see that while the people groups, the ruling powers usurping the right of God's nation to their land, changed over time. And while that changed, the issue continued to be the land and the quest to rule over that land in spite of the fact that God had previously given that land to Abraham, to Isaac, and to Jacob, and to Jacob's descendants, namely the 12 tribes of Israel. Uh, it becomes very obvious at this point, or at least it should, that Israel's fifth and final bucket of wrath was all about the land. You were never promised that land. I was never promised that land. Israel alone was promised that land. So we can see that the law contract, as clearly spelled out in Leviticus, the law contract and, and Deuteronomy, and the law failure confession and the nation go hand in hand. Um, and uh, that land is being usurped, or the right to the land, uh, uh, usurpation made by Israel's enemies when it came to Israel's right to that land and that God had given them in his plan to repossess the earth. Uh, and for himself, God himself, through Christ, to be head over this realm of his creation. In Daniel chapter 2, we saw how Daniel was able to tell the king about the image that the king kept seeing in his dreams. And then further explain to the king that the various parts of that image stood for certain kingdoms or ruling powers that would be serving themselves of Israel by ruling over the land that had been given to Israel. Then in Daniel chapter 7, we saw Daniel go further and ascribe to those kingdoms the names of certain beasts. So when you're reading about beasts in the book of the Revelation, for instance, or in Daniel, you're reading about these ruling powers, these kingdoms that were serving themselves of Israel by, by ruling over their land. While Daniel mentioned that there would be four beasts in connection with Bucket of Wrath number five, he only mentioned three animal names when it came to those four beasts. The first beast or kingdom pictured Babylon, the lion, and Israel's 70-year captivity by the king of, over the Babylonian kingdom, King Nebuchadnezzar. Uh, the kingdom of Babylon served itself as is, of Israel for a period of 70 years so the land could enjoy its rests. The prophet Jeremiah gave us that 70-year time span. However, as we noted in our previous lesson, the 70-year period of Babylonian captivity was merely the first installment, we might say, the first part of the pouring out of the wrath that was sitting in bucket number five. There was more installments or more pourings to come, as we're going to see. When Israel's 70-year time of captivity came to an end, Daniel was making his confession, as all in the nation were called upon to do. The sin failure or law failure confession called for in Leviticus chapter 26, beginning with verse 40, but note carefully, Daniel was not relaying the particular sins he committed in order to have those sins forgiven. That's what we've turned it into today. Uh, he was simply admitting that he, along with all of the children of Israel, the forefathers of Israel, had failed to faithfully and consistently live up to the dictates of that law contract as their forefathers had sworn the Israelites were capable of doing. There are three passages in Scripture that go hand in hand with Israel's law failure confession and the connection that confession, confection, uh, confession has with Israel obtaining their land. Uh, you should have these passages clearly marked in your Bibles uh, because they explain some things that otherwise are very confusing. Uh, this was a confession God required of the nation that he placed under the law. 
Um, and it's quite a different thing from the way God is operating in this dispensation of grace. The first passage is Leviticus chapter 26, verses 40 through 42. The second passage is Daniel chapter 9, verse four through, verses 4 through 6, along with verse 11. And the third passage is 1 John chapter 1, verses 8 and 9. We'll read those. But these are passages you should have marked in your Bible because this has caused so much confusion in the church, so-called church today, professing church today, when it comes to understanding 1 John 1, 9. Israel's law failure confession is wrapped up in these three passages of Scripture. Uh, let's read them in order that they appear in the Bible, and then uh, as we read them, we'll take special notice of the plural pronouns in each passage. Uh, 1 Leviticus chapter 26, verses 40 through 42. If they... Now, this is said in direct context of the five buckets of wrath and the nation that would experience those five buckets of wrath. If they, Israel, corporately, shall confess their national iniquity and the iniquity of their fathers with their fathers trespass, which their fathers trespassed against me, and that also they, their fathers, have walked contrary unto me, and also I ha and, and that I also have walked contrary unto them, and have brought them into the land of their enemies. If then their, their uncircumcised hearts be humbled, humbled in what way? They thought they could keep that law contract for their righteousness. And they then accept of the punishment of their iniquity, which was the remainder, the pouring out of the buckets. <clears throat> so there was a particular, pardon me, reason why God wanted the law contract nation uh, to make their law failure confession. Uh, only upon the nation making that law failure confession would God do something in return for that confession. Now, why, what would he do if they made their confession? Well, here it is sitting in verse 42. Then, should the nation Israel make their law failure confession, will I remember my covenant with Jacob and also my covenant with Isaac? And also my covenant with Abraham. That was the covenant for the land. Will I remember, and then, after that national confession has been made, I will remember the land. So you see how the land is tied hand in hand with the law failure confession? You see, God would not recognize the nation Israel as being his special nation, a peculiar treasure unto himself, a nation above all nations of the earth, a holy nation, a kingdom of priests, until they made their law failure confession, a confession the nation's never made. What's more, until that national proclamation of their law failure confession, until that was made, God would refuse to recognize the land in connection with a regathered nation. It's as simple as that. It's impossible to separate Israel's law failure confession with the land God promised to Abraham, to Isaac, and to Jacob, and to Jacob's descendants as Leviticus chapter 26, verse 42, just pointed out as clearly as God could point it out to us. Um, the law contract and the land go hand in hand, just as the law failure confession fits right into place. Thus, God's requirement of a law failure confession by the law contract nation. I uh, don't know how else to say it. Listen to Daniel as he was sitting at the end of the first 70 years, sitting in bucket number five. He was sitting at the end of the Babylonian captivity as he made his law failure confession in Daniel chapter 9, verses 4 through 7. Tell me if he was speaking of himself only or if Daniel was speaking of the nation as a whole in the confession that we're about to hear, about to read. Daniel chapter 9, beginning with verse 4. Here Daniel says, And I prayed unto the Lord my God and made my confession. This is the confession of sin. It was the confession of a failure to keep the law. Uh, I made my confession, Daniel said, and said, O Lord, the great and dreadful God, keeping the covenant, that's the law contract, and mercy to them that love him and to them that keep his commandments. This is law. What's your confession, Daniel? Well, here it is in verses 5 and 6. We, not I, but we. This is the national confession every person was to make. We have sinned and have committed iniquity and have done wickedly and have rebelled. How so, Daniel? By departing from thy precepts and from thy judgments, the law contract. Neither have we as a nation hearkened unto thy servants the prophets, which spake in thy name to our kings. Do you see all the plural pronouns? Our princes, our fathers, and to all the people of the land. All of the people of the land, in Daniel's uh, statement, there is a reference to the land nation, folks, the law contract nation. Uh, the nation Israel. Now jump down with me to verse 11, the same chapter. Yea, how many? 
All Israel, that's what it says. All Israel have transgressed thy law. That's pretty clear, is it not? It was a national confession about a national failure to keep the law. Even by departing, departing what? The answer is departing the law contract. That they, the nation, might not obey thy voice. Therefore the curse is poured upon us. What cursed? Uh, well, the curse was that fifth bucket of wrath that had fallen upon the entire nation that we've been reading about. And as a result of that fifth bucket of wrath, a scattered Israel. An Israel outside of the land. And, and, and the oath that is written in the law of Moses, the servant of God, because we, as an entire nation, have sinned against him. That's a law failure confession made for the law contract nation. has nothing to do with Gentiles. It has nothing to do with us today. In this dispensation, we are not under law, but under grace. Israel's law, failure, confession, and the land go hand in hand. The two are inseparably linked. Uh, it was not a listing of particular sins, as you can plainly see, in order to get those sins forgiven. We've invented that today. It was a confession of a national failure where the law contract nation was concerned. Every pronoun is plural in these passages because the confession was to be made by the nation as a whole. If you were a Jew born under the law, and if you wanted to become a part or be a part, considered to be a part of that peculiar treasure nation, you had to make your law failure confession. It was as simple as that. When John came along, John clearly understood the necessity of Israel making their law failure confession because John understood the connection between Israel's law failure confession and the land. Listen to his words in 1 John chapter 1 verses 8 and 9 as John was writing to the people of Israel. Uh, we can clearly prove that from John itself. Tell me if the pronouns are singular or plural in this passage from John that really fits into the tribulation period as all of the circumcision epistles do. They fit into the tribulation period which was pushed forward as God ushered in this age of grace. Listen to John here. If we, Israel, say that we nationally have no sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. If we, corporately, Israel, confess our sins, this is a law failure confession, he's faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Um, if we make our, our confession, what's the opposite of making their confession? Saying at the first part of the verse, if we say that we have no sin. It's all about that law contract. If we say that we have not sinned, we make him a liar and his word is not in us. Uh, so John's calling upon Israel to make their law failure confession. And even Paul was praying that Israel corporately might be saved. His prayer to God for Israel is that they corporately might be preserved and given that status back that God promised them as his, his peculiar treasure. John was writing to Israel, folks, to the people who had been under the law contract. And he was writing prior to the regathering of Israel that will take place at the return of Jesus Christ to the earth. John was calling for the people of the law contract nation to make their law failure confession so that God might once again recognize Israel to be his peculiar treasure, a nation above all nations of the earth. John was not writing to the people to which the Apostle Paul had been sent in accordance with a special dispensation com committed to his trust for us. John was writing to Jews, not to Gentiles. How do we know that John was writing to Jews and not to Gentiles? We know that because John made that very clear in 1 John chapter 2, verse 2. Notice what he states there, and you'll notice the direction of his writing. 1 John chapter 2, verse 2. And he, Jesus Christ, is the propitiation, meaning fully satisfying payment, for our sins. Who was John writing to through the use of the pronoun our there? He was writing to the people of Israel, as the remainder of the verse will prove. And not for ours only, the people I'm writing to right now, the people to whom this letter went, but also for the sins of the whole world. So John in 1 John 2.2 2, is writing in connection with what he had learned from Paul about Christ becoming a ransom for all to be testified in due time. But by saying he's a propitiation not for only for our sins but for the sins of the whole world, we know the direction of John's letter and it was Israel. It wasn't the Gentiles. Perhaps the most misunderstood issue in all of Christendom so called today and even for those, many of those who claim to rightly divide the word of truth, is the national forgiveness that remains a requirement of God 
in connection with Israel's law contract failure in order for God to make the law contract nation Israel that peculiar treasure again unto himself a holy nation above all the Gentile nations above all the Gentiles and a kingdom of priests and for God to remember the land in connection with that nation when God remembers the land Israel won't have a little strip Israel will have everything from the Nile River in Egypt all the way to the Tigris Euphrates rivers uh, they will have it all that God promised Abraham to begin with. Uh, the nation there today is not a nation regathered by God or being regathered by God according to prophecy. Uh, that will not take place till Christ returns at his second coming and the angelic host go out and gather them from the four corners of the earth as elect earthly nation. Today God's not dealing with any nation above any other nation. He didn't turn believing Gentiles into spiritual Israel as some teach. He placed unbelieving Israel on the lower plane of the previously outcast Gentiles that God might have mercy upon all today as would be later taught by the Apostle Paul. But when Israel's fifth and final bucket of wrath is taken back off of the shelf, so to speak, when this dispensation of grace comes to a close and with the pouring out of the remainder of its contents, many in Israel will indeed be ready to make their required law failure confession. Uh, the confession that John was pleading for the Jews to make in his day. Uh, it shouldn't surprise us that John was calling upon the Jews of his day to make their law contract failure confession. As I said earlier, John knew God's requirement that that confession be made in order uh, that the saints of that kingdom program might regain their land and all of it that had been promised them, a land that they had lost to those who were serving themselves of that land. Uh, John wanted Israel to be restored to her position of prominence with God. So the law failure confession had to do with a prominent position and the land. A prominent position for a nation and the land. That's what the law failure confession was all about. Paul wanted the same thing. As we see his prayer in Romans chapter 10 verse 1, notice what he wrote, what Paul wrote in connection with his kinsmen after the flesh that he dearly loved. Brethren, my heart's desire and prayer to God for Israel, corporately, Israel as a nation, is that they nationally might be saved, meaning preserved, delivered, restored to their prominent position and gaining the land that God had promised them. Just be careful not to confuse the law failure confession that God required to be made by his law contract nation for the purposes of remembering that land and restoring Israel to her nationally prominent position with what God's doing today while God's program to repossess uh, the heavenly realm is, is in place. Don't confuse his program to repossess the earthly realm uh, when that program has been placed on hold with his program today when we are not under law but under grace. We were never under law. Satan's ongoing contention with God and it was from way back. Uh, ever since God set up his throne room in the third heaven and told Adam to take dominion of the land, um, Satan's ongoing contention with God uh, has been over the rightful ownership and rulership of the land that Jacob called God's house, the land God gave to the nation he promised to make of Abram. So don't, don't confuse all these things with today. This has to do with Israel. Now if I get these things all confused and I have to change things around in order to try to make them work, then I'm going to have people today telling people today, you better make your confession of sins. And that means reciting to God every sin you've committed so that God can forget that, forgive that sin. Oh, you've got new sins? Then those need to be confessed so you get those new sins forgiven because new sins stand between you and God. No, they don't. Nothing stands between a believer and the God to whom he's joined, which is Christ Jesus. Nothing. Uh, let's go back now to Daniel chapter 2. Daniel was sitting at the end of the 70-year Babylonian captivity. The captivity that began with the initial pouring out of the elements of, the, of Bucket of Wrath number 5. Daniel knew full well that there was more sitting, more wrath sitting in that bucket of uh, uh, number 5 than the initial 70 year pouring out of the wrath in that bucket. And that was so the land could enjoy its rest. What Daniel did not know was how much more was sitting in Bucket of Wrath number 5. Um, before he could add the amen to his law failure confession prayer, Daniel noticed a special visitor that had come his way. That visitor was none other than the angelic host member Gabriel, uh, God's chief messenger uh, of the angelic realm. Notice the reason why God sent Gabriel to Daniel beginning with verse 23. At the beginning of thy supplications, in other words, when you first began praying, Daniel, making your law failure confession, the commandment came forth and I am come to show you 
I'm come to show thee, for thou art greatly beloved. Therefore, understand the matter, Daniel, and consider the vision. The word consider is an important word in this passage when you understand uh, the etymology of words and how, how they're used. It's a significant part of this verse, as I may have pointed out in a previous lesson, because the prefix con, C-O-N, and consider, con means contrasting, hold things together. Daniel is being told by Gabriel to hold one thing up against another thing, and that by doing so, he would be shown something. In other words, hold the vision up, Daniel, that you've been able to interpret, interpret for King Nebuchadnezzar. Look at the Gentile dom dominions that are yet to play a part. In, in the history of the nation Israel before they get that kingdom that I promised them. These are the Gentile dominions, Daniel, that you've already been shown in the figure. You just have to have names put into the figure. Um, and so this is what Daniel's told to do. Match the dominions you've been given to see in the image with the time periods I'm about to give you now as, as Gabriel was about to, to appoint some time periods to those kingdoms and uh, that would be serving themselves of Israel's land. Put simply, there's a time schedule for the remainder of Bucket of Wrath number five, Daniel. That's what he was being told. God dealt with Israel according to times, signs, and seasons. And so there's a time frame in connection with this bucket. The Gentile dominions represented by the image in, in the king's dream uh, will serve themselves of the land throughout the remaining time that God has allotted to this final bucket of wrath. The bucket that's, that's already begun to pour out upon your people, Daniel. So with that, Daniel was about to be given a breakdown of the scope of the remainder of wrath sitting in bucket of wrath number five. Here it is as we continue in verse 24. Seventy weeks. Now we know that's weeks of years. That can be proven easily. We won't take the time to do it right here. Seventy weeks of years or an additional 490 years are determined upon thy people and upon thy holy city to finish the transgression, singular. That's, that's the failure to keep the law contract. And to make an end of sins, and to make reconciliation for iniquity, and to bring in everlasting righteousness, and to seal up the vision and prophecy, and to anoint the most holy. Several things mentioned there in that passage. We'll be looking at the issue of the 70 weeks in a few minutes, but before we consider the time elements associated with that fifth bucket of wrath, we need to consider what God designed those 490 additional years of, con uh, of wrath uh, uh, that Israel would experience when it comes to Satan's contention over the land that Israel had lost uh, and what those 490 years were meant to accomplish. And Daniel's just give us a listing there. Gabriel mentions six things in verse, in verse 24, as you can see. And that period of 70 weeks, or again, 490 years, would have to play out in order to, number one, finish the transgression. Number two, make an end of sins. Number three, make reconciliation for iniquity. Number four, bring in everlasting righteousness. Number five, seal up the vision and prophecy. And number six, anoint the most holy. There's six things. What are they about? Now, let's take them one at a time, see if we can explain them. Seventy weeks are determined upon thy people, on Israel, Gabriel, and upon thy holy city, Jerusalem, to finish the transgression. What did Gabriel mean by the statement to finish the transgressions? Did he say transgressions or transgression? Clearly you can see it's transgression, a singular transgression. Uh, it's singular, not plural. In other words, Israel as a nation had been guilty of a single transgression, a national transgression, we might say. And it would take the entire outpouring of their fifth bucket of wrath before God would consider that contractual punishment for that transgression to have played out in its fullness. Uh, what singular transgression did Israel commit? Well, you folks know quite well if you've been following these series, these studies. We have to go back to the prophet Hosea to find the answer, and we've, we've done that. We'll do it again. Keep in mind that in vowing to keep all of the law, all of the time, Israel had agreed to enter into a marriage relationship with the Lord. Marriage is a covenant relationship. And the law of Moses represents the marriage vows that Israel had entered into with the one who had said he had become their husband. Uh, they had promised to, to keep perfectly faithfully and consistently the, their marriage vows. Uh, so 
Those marriage vows were, they promised to keep them in Deuteronomy chapter 6, verse 25. Verse you can look up on your own sometime. When, when they said, give us this law and it'll be our righteousness. You do this, we'll do that. You do the other, we'll do this. That was the vows, the marriage vows for their marriage relationship. God became Israel's husband. Scripture proves it. And Israel became God's wife. No union in this marriage relationship had taken place. And it, it never had, never has. In fact, it will in time future. Um, but no union had taken place back then between Israel nationally and God because they broke their marriage vows and God divorced them. There had been no union at all, but a perfectly valid marriage nonetheless. Notice the words of the prophet Isaiah as he described the marriage relationship uh, between God and Israel in Isaiah chapter 54, verse 5. We've talked about these things in previous lessons, but we must reconsider some of them now in light of the fact that Gabriel was revealing to Daniel that there were 490 additional years in their bucket to finish the transgression. Uh, Isaiah chapter 54, verse 5. For thy maker is thine husband. This is Israel. The Lord of hosts is his name, and thy redeemer, the Holy One of Israel. Uh, the God of the whole earth shall he be called. The problem was that Israel had sworn they could and would be faithful to their marriage vows. The law of Moses. Israel's failure to be faithful to the Most High God, the nation's husband, was declared by the prophet Jeremiah in, Ch in Jeremiah chapter 3, verse 20, where the prophet speaking God's word stated this about the unfaithful wife. Surely as a wife treacherously departeth from her husband, so have ye dealt treacherously with me, O house of Israel, saith the Lord. But simply Israel lied. They lied when they promised God they could be faithful to their marriage vows, the law of Moses. Hosea put it this way in Hosea chapter 10, verse 4. They have spoken words, swearing falsely, and making a covenant, a marriage covenant. Thus judgment springeth up as hemlock in the furrows of the field. So when Gabriel told Daniel that 70 weeks or 490 additional years were sitting in bucket of wrath number 5 in order to finish the transgression, singular, he was letting Daniel know that Israel's spiritual idolatry called fornication by her prophets, led to the pouring out of the entire contents of this fifth bucket of wrath. And that Israel had contracted for this bucket to fall when they signed on to the law contract at Mount Sinai. They contracted for these buckets of wrath. God had already proven their incapacity to achieve righteousness through their performance while they were in the wilderness. Now that bucket of wrath number five had begun to fall, their idolatry, called fornication once again, led to their being removed from God's house, removed from the land. And their re-entrance to the land as God's special nation, a peculiar nation above all nations, would not take place uh, until bucket of wrath number five was completely emptied of Israel's judgment consequences. Oh, they went back to their land after the 70-year captivity, some of them. But going back to their land by, a, by the permission of Cyrus is something totally different than God gathering all of the elect back to the land. Seventy weeks of years or 490 additional years of judgment were sitting in bucket of wrath number five in order to bring about a resolution to the judgment that came as a result of Israel's lie, their transgression. The transgression they had proven by way of their spiritual fornication. So that would, when the judgment for that would be played out why? Because God knew something would take place when the fifth bucket was empty. We'll get to that in a minute. That additional 490 years of wrath sitting in this fifth and final bucket of wrath would result in something further according to the angel Gabriel. It would make an end of sins. Now what does that mean? To make an end of sins. What did Gabriel mean by saying that when this bucket is empty it will make an end of sins? Uh, this is a statement that can be taken two different ways and both are equally valid and both correct. First of all, Israel contracted for a particular type of punishment when they said they could live up to the law contract uh, and, and do it faithfully and consistently. The punishment they contracted for was sitting in this final bucket of, of punishment. And you all recall that it meant expulsion from being in the land as God's peculiar treasure and a kingdom of priests, holy nation. So when this fifth bucket of wrath is finally empty, the sins connected to Israel not becoming that peculiar treasure under God, a nation above all nations of the earth, will have been resolved. So that God can then do with them what he always intended to do with them. These are contracted, Israel had contracted not to commit these sins. So these sins are indeed tied to the contract. 
And so in order for this fifth bucket to play out, or when it plays out, God will be able to make them into what he needs them to be because their law contract failure would be finished. Uh, the additional 490 years would spell an end to the sins connected to the contract. We might put it that way. The sins that had brought the removal of the nation from the land that God had given them. Uh, but that additional 490 years sitting in bucket of wrath number five would make an end of sins in another way. It would actually make an end of sinning. Did you know that? It'll make an end of sinning where the nation Israel's concerned, those who have made their law contract failure confession. Um, if you recall, the new covenant that God promised to make with the house of Israel, the house of Judah, uh, you, may re you may remember this particular aspect of the new covenant promise. It's sitting in Ezekiel chapter 36, verse 27. And this is something else I think misunderstood today. Notice what God promised to do with Israel in this passage in their new covenant when they have their land. Ezekiel 36, 27, I will put my spirit within you, Israel. And here it is, I will do what? I will cause you to walk in my statutes, and ye shall keep my judgments, and ye shall do them. Not may, should, would, could. You shall do them. Why will a believing Israel in time future keep God's statutes and judgments and do them when bucket of wrath number five is finally empty and Israel gains her king and her promised earthly kingdom? The answer is because God is going to cause them to do so. Um, but we need to understand that this is not something God is going to command that they do, as with the former covenant that he made with them, called the law contract, Mount Sinai. And keeping his statutes and judgments is not something that God will insist that they do. So they just have to do it to keep him pleased. It's not what it's about at all. This is something that God himself is going to do for them, on their behalf. How do we know that to be the case? Well, the word cause in verse 27 is a very important word to understand when it comes to Israel and their non-ability in time future to sin. The word cause is the Hebrew word asah, A-S-A-H. It means accomplish, bring forth, execute, and perform. I'll give you some examples of the Hebrew word asah in scripture, and that'll help in, in our understanding of how it is that Israel will keep God's statutes and commandments in time future and be unable to do otherwise. The very first time the Hebrew word asa is used in scripture is found in Genesis chapter 1, verse 7. Let's take a quick look. And God made, the word made, A-S-A-H, and God asa, God made the firmament and divided the waters which were under the firmament from the waters which were above the firmament, and it was so. Tell me, did God somewhat tell someone else to make the firmament? Did he tell man to make it and then insist that, that man do it? Or did God himself do the performing when he made the firmament? Um, the answer is a simple one. God didn't tell someone else to do uh, and then insist that someone do it. God is the one who performed it, and Christ is God. Uh, he executed it or accomplished it. There are numerous examples of the word I saw in the book of Genesis. We haven't time to go through all of them. I'm, many, many, many occurrences. Uh, but one of those is in Genesis chapter 2, verse 18, where the same idea is presented of God doing all the performing and doing all that performing all by himself. Look at Genesis chapter 2 verse 18. And the Lord God said it is not good that man should be alone. I will make. Those three words is A-S-A-H in the Hebrew. I will make him and help meet for him. So obviously God didn't tell Adam to fashion his own helper. Or to help in the fashioning of that helper. Uh, God didn't even instruct and then insist that Adam do so. God did it for Adam. God caused Eve to come forth from Adam's rib. So God did it, and he did it all by himself. That's the word A-S-H, A-S-A-H. I will do it. I will perform it. God is the one who executed it or performed it. And for that, God didn't need Adam to perform anything. God himself did all the performing that was to be done. The wrap-up to God's creative work is seen in Genesis chapter 2, verse 3. Let's take a quick look at that passage where we're also going to see that same word, a-S-A-H. God blessed the seventh day and sanctified it, set it apart, because that in it he had rested from all his work which God created and made. Guess what? And made, what word that is in Hebrew? That's A-S-A-H. Asa. I do it. I'll do it by myself. So the idea wrapped up in the Hebrew word asa should be firmly established in our minds at this point. 
But since we found that statement concerning God's new covenant with the house of Israel and the house of Judah in the book of Ezekiel, let's go back to the book of Ezekiel to see how God, the Holy Spirit, used the word Asa in that book. These two verses should establish even more firmly in our minds the fact that Asa is used in connection with something God himself will do. Uh, the first is Ezekiel chapter 12, verse 25. Notice that who, it, who it is that will do the performing in this passage in Ezekiel. For I am the Lord, I will speak, and the word that I shall speak shall come to pass. It shall be no more prolonged, for in your day, O rebellious house, will I say the word, and three words, and it's the, those three words are the word Asa. I will perform it, saith the Lord. Not man, not a helper. God himself is going to perform it. The expression, I will perform it, is one word in the Hebrew language. It's that word, Asa, once again. But notice carefully, it is God who promised to do the performing. He's not insisting someone else inform, uh, perform. Uh, he's doing it. The same is true in Ezekiel chapter 22, verse 14, where the prophet, speaking for the Most High God, said this. Uh, Ezekiel said in 22, chapter 22, verse 14, Can thine heart endure, or can thy hands be strong in the days that I shall deal with thee? I, the Lord, have spoken it, and, I, the Lord, implied, Asa will do it. I will do it. So put it all together, and what do we have? We have the answer as to how God is going to, uh, I mean, how Israel is going to keep God's judgments and statutes when their fifth bucket of wrath is finally empty. And God restores them to their land and grants them their promised king and their promised kingdom. God is going to perform it in them. They're not going to do the performing. God will be doing the performing in them. When he said to Israel, the new covenant he promised to make with them in Ezekiel chapter 36, verses 27 and 28, and I will put my spirit within you and I will cause you to walk in my statutes. And you shall keep my judgments and do them. And you shall dwell in the land that I gave to your fathers and you shall be my people and I will be your God. He wasn't asking Israel to do something for him when they gained their land. He was telling Israel what, that he was going to do something for them. In connection with keeping his statutes, keeping his judgments, he was saying, I will make it happen, Israel. I will execute it. I will produce it. I will be the one who performs the action. I am going to be the one who brings it about. I will accomplish it. These are all ways to look at this Asa. I will complete it. I will fulfill it. I myself will do it, Israel, and you'll not be capable of doing otherwise. You won't be able to act contrary to what I'm going to do in you. What he's really saying to Israel, in essence, is watch what I'm going to do for you. Watch what I'm going to do with you because you need to watch what I'm going to do in you. This is the essence here. Put simply, Israel will become the instruments of God's working in such a manner that Israel will be incapable of operating contrary to that working. Uh, it will be impossible for God's kingdom of priests to sin. Now do you see what happens when we come to 1 John? And John says, we cannot sin. We cannot sin. We have whatever we ask because we keep his commandments. Now, how do Bible interpreters bring that across and make it, try to make it apply today? We have the spirit in us, but can we sin? He's not causing us to walk in his ways because we rebel more often than not. But the reality is they will be caused to walk in his ways. But if I have to find out a way to try to make the first John passage fit in this dispensation of grace, when John says we cannot sin, I'm going to change that around and say, well, we can't do it continually. Oh, really? We can't sin continually. Well, we can sin a little bit, but we can't make it a lifestyle. We can't make sin a lifestyle. Sin is our lifestyle. Um, and it's our lifestyle because the the... While the old man's gone, the sin nature still resides in the old tent, or the new tent, rather, or the old tent, rather. We are the new man residing in the old tent, and the sin nature is still present. Now, follow it through, and you see something very interesting take place here. When Christ ascended to the Father, after he had risen from the dead, and then he appeared that same evening in the upper room, notice what he told his disciples in Luke chapter 12, uh, verse 32, he said, Fear not, little flock, for it is your Father's good pleasure to give you the kingdom. With that granting of the kingdom and its new covenant promises to the little flock, their apostle John added this in John chapter 20, verses 21 and 22. 
Then said Jesus unto them again, Peace be unto you, and as my Father hath sent me, even so send I you. And when he had said this, he breathed on them, not in them, not, uh, but at them, or on them, and saith unto them, Receive ye the Holy Ghost. Pentecost hadn't taken place. Wait a minute. Pentecost had not arrived. This event took place at least 50 days prior to Pentecost when the Holy Spirit came upon them at Pentecost. This event was that special event of those disciples being born from above or born again as so often used in our day. This new birth was a special new birth reserved for believing Israel when they gained the earthly kingdom promised them. But it was the Father's good pleasure to give that kingdom and those new kingdom uh, covenant promises to Christ's disciples in the upper room. John said in 1 John chapter 2, verse 20, But ye have an unction from the Holy One, and ye know all things. You see where a particular denominational persuasion uh, uses the other, it's only used twice in the Bible, that word translated unction, and the other time it's translated anointing. Now do you see where denomination comes into play that says, we have that anointing today. So therefore, we know all things. You need a word of knowledge? I'll give you one. I'll tell you where you should do this, where you should do that, how to do it, because God's given me a word for you. I have the anointing. And now you see where they get it. Um, but ye have an unction from the Holy One, John said, and ye know all things. Well, why not? Part of that new covenant that God promised to make with the house of Israel and the house of Judah included some supernatural knowledge concerning uh, the Lord that the recipients of that earthly kingdom were to be given. Here it is in Jeremiah chapter 31, verse 34. And they shall teach no more every man his neighbor, and every man his brother, saying, Know the Lord, for they shall all know me. From the least of them unto the greatest of them, saith the Lord, for I will forgive their iniquity, singular, their law transgression, and I will remember their sin, a reference to their national sin, and I will remember it how long? No more. So nationally, Israel's forgiven their national failure, their law contract failure. That new covenant unction only spoken of twice in the Bible, and in the other instances, again, I said translated anointing, was only true of the little flock to which it had been the Father's good pleasure to give the kingdom prior to the setting up of that kingdom here on the earth. Christ breathed upon the little flock there in the upper room, Israel's new covenant unction. The unction that God knew would cause all those granted that special unction to walk in his statutes and keep his judgments and do them. Uh, that unction would remain active for that little flock as long as God's earthly kingdom program with the nation Israel remained the program in progress. This is why John, in his statement concerning those who had been granted that special new covenant unction, could write in 1 John chapter 3, verses 9 and 10, Whosoever is born of God, that's the new birth for Israel, that's the required being born from above. Whosoever is born of God doth not commit sin. Could you apply that to your life today? So you're not born again? No, you're regenerated, which is a new beginning, but you're not born again. That was Israel's program, and it was the born from above that Israel's going to need to have their kingdom and be operating in connection with the new covenant promises given to them. He does not commit sin, for his seed remaineth in him, and he cannot sin. So now we're going to change that and say, well, he can, but he can't do it all the time. He can only do it part of the time. Uh, how much sin are we, can we do today? But they cannot sin because he's born of God. He's born from above. In this, the children of God are manifest in the children of the devil. Whosoever doeth not righteousness is not of God, neither he that loveth not his brother. If you've got a problem with your brother, you don't have the unction. <laughs> and guess who doesn't have the unction today? None of us have that unction that was breathed on Israel, the little flock in the upper room. Again, John was not writing to the Gentiles, but to the Jews, which we've already proven from the book of 1 John itself. We need to be careful not to confuse Israel's new covenant unction and God causing them to walk in his statutes and keep his judgments and the necessity of that new birth for Israel to become God's holy nation in their promised earthly kingdom with the new beginning the Apostle Paul tells us is true of all believers during the special dispensation of Gentile grace, the dispensation of grace of, of God that's in place today. Nowhere in Paul's epistles does the Apostle of the Gentiles ever mention the necessity of being born again. Uh, in fact, Paul never used that expression and for very good reason. Being born again or born from above had to do with receiving the new covenant unction God promised 
in connection with the house of Israel and the house of Judah. The program that was in place until the stoning of Stephen in Acts chapter 7 and the conversion of, of Saul of Tarsus in Acts chapter 9. Those who believe Paul's gospel today, the gospel of Christ, definitely have a new beginning according to our apostle. Paul talked about a believer's new beginning in Titus chapter 3 verse 5 where he said, not by works of righteousness which we have done, but according to his mercy he saved us by the washing of, here's the word, regeneration and renewing of the Holy Ghost. The word translated regeneration, the word Paul used in connection with the believers of this dispensation, is the Greek palingenesia, which simply means new beginning. Uh, you can see the word genesis in that Greek word, palingenesia there. I think you can see that. Believers today have a new beginning. In, how so? We're joined to the person of our Savior the very instant we take God at his word uh, concerning what Christ accomplished when he died for our sins at Calvary was buried, putting those sins out of God's sight, and rose again as proof that God was satisfied with the payment Christ made. Um, so we have a new beginning, and our new beginning has to do with our being joined to our Savior. Not a new birth in, from above where God has breathed upon us that unction so that we can no longer sin, we know all things and have need of no teacher, and always do his statutes and judgments and keep them. We have a new beginning, to be sure. Just as a little flock had a new beginning when they received that unction, thus being born from above. But our new beginning is not the same as Israel's new covenant unction. We need to understand that. The unction that Christ breathed upon the little flock in the upper room that would cause those believers to walk in his ways and keep his statutes. John went on to say, as I mentioned earlier, we have whatever we ask because we keep his commandments. Um, you know, as one of our current day TV doctors would say, How, how's that working for you? Uh, today, Gentiles. Our holiness today comes not from being caused to walk in his ways, keeping his statutes and judgments. That's not how our holiness comes. Our holiness today comes from being joined to the person of a perfectly righteous Savior, the Son of God himself, our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. There's a difference, and I hope you see it. Like the little flock of time past, believing Israel of time future will indeed have that same unction that the little flock received in the upper room when the when the kingdom saints of time future enter their promised earthly kingdom. This is the second way that God will make an end of sins where the nation of Israel is concerned. And that's who, he was writing, who Gabriel was speaking of when he was speaking to Daniel. When their fifth and final bucket of wrath is finally emptied of all of its remaining contents. So the emptying of bucket of wrath number five with the completion of the additional 490 years of wrath sitting in that bucket would finish the transgression according to Gabriel and make an end of sins. And then the third thing Gabriel told Daniel, that additional 490 years would accomplish, is to make reconciliation for iniquity. Why would it take an additional 70 weeks of years, 490 more years, to make reconciliation for iniquity? Well, the opposite of reconciliation is what word? Anyone know? Alienation. God is the one who set the five buckets of wrath before Israel in the first place. After they had sworn they could earn their special nation status, and by way of their performance, only to turn their backs on the one they had made that promise to. In his foreknowledge, God had known all along that it would take the entire pouring out of all of the contents of all of the five buckets of wrath in order to prove to the nation that they had failed and to bring that nation to the point of being willing to make their law failure confession. Through these buckets of wrath, God wanted Israel to see the alienation that their, the sins they contracted not to commit had brought between them and him as a nation. By giving that time frame of the fifth bucket of wrath and the fact that the contents of this final bucket of wrath would bring Israel to the realization of their sins and their need of him, the emptying of this bucket would establish the reconciliation that this bucket was intended to establish between God and his special nation. When this bucket is empty, there will be no national alienation between God and Israel. The national alienation will be over. And that's what he's talking about there. It'll bring reconciliation, a national reconciliation. Then there was the fourth thing that emptying this fifth bucket would accomplish, uh, according to Gabriel. It would, it would take that additional 490 years to bring in everlasting righteousness. Now, what's that about, to bring in everlasting righteousness? It's about the righteousness that is to be brought to the earth when Christ returns to the earth. Uh, to rule and to reign, and uh, um, it'll, be, it'll be about the establishment of Christ's kingdom on the earth where Christ's righteousness 
will be the order of the day. Uh, for starters, we can look at Psalms chapter 9, verse 8. We're speaking of the reign of Christ. The psalmist wrote, And he, Jesus Christ, shall judge the world in righteousness. He shall minister judgment to the people in uprightness. Now, a verse concerning the everlasting righteousness that is to be brought in when Israel's fifth bucket of wrath is finally empty uh, is sitting in Isaiah chapter 16, verse 5. And in mercy shall the throne, the throne of God on earth, be established, uh, Christ's throne, and he shall sit upon it in truth in the tabernacle of David, judging and seeking judgment and hasting, here it is, righteousness. The prophet Jeremiah spoke of the same bringing in of everlasting righteousness, only he said it this way, Jeremiah chapter 33, verses 14 through 16. Here he said, Behold, the days come, saith the Lord, that I will perform that good thing which I have promised unto the house of Israel, to the house of Judah. In those days and at that time will I cause the branch of righteousness to grow up unto David. He shall execute judgment and righteousness in the land. In those days shall Judah be saved, delivered, and Jerusalem shall dwell safely. And this is the name where, wherewith she shall be called the Lord our righteousness. So you see, it's all about God's name all over again. It's about God's name and Israel learning the meaning of God's name and their necessity of casting themselves upon him to do for them what they would never have the capacity to do for him. When Christ returns to the earth to rule and to reign, the prophecy concerning the nations that would be serving themselves of Israel will have run their course and Israel will be in possession of the land that God promised to them. Uh, when it comes to the anointing, the most the anointing the most holy one, Bible scholars believe this has to do with anointing the most holy place and I tend to be in agreement with that which is seen as being the millennial temple that will be um, anointed. The three words the most holy are only one word in the Hebrew it's the word Kodesh uh, which literally means a sacred place also defined by the word sanctuary. So to anoint the most holy place. Um, thus the reasoning that this isn't a person being anointed as king. Christ will surely reign in that capacity, but the millennial temple itself will be consecrated unto the one who will rule and reign therein, Jesus Christ, the Prince of Peace. It'll take the emptying of the, the entire 490 year emptying process to bring that back to play, that temple back into place where and be anointed as it God intends it to be. The question we need to ask at this time is how much of that 490 additional years are sitting in the bucket uh, for Israel before God uh, can repossess the earthly realm? Um, he's put that on hold for time, but how many of that 490 years played themselves out and how many remain in the bucket? Um, because God began dealing with the nations without distinction when he ushered in the Apostle Paul. To answer that question, we need to return to the information very quickly that Gabriel was relaying to Daniel because Gabriel was setting forth a time element sitting in that bucket. Let's go to Daniel chapter 9, verse 25. Know therefore and understand, Daniel, that from the going forth of the commandment to restore and to build Jerusalem unto the Messiah the Prince shall be seven weeks, that's 49 years, and additionally, or after that 49 years, three score and two weeks, meaning 434 years more. The street shall be built again, the wall, even in troublous times. Why do you suppose Gabriel broke uh, that remaining 490 year time period uh, for this fifth bucket into two different time periods? 49 years and 432 years. Do you suppose those were just hap haphazard elements of time Gabriel chose to use, just throw something in there? Or do you think he had a particular purpose in mind behind those time periods that he gave? There's an importance to those two time periods because uh, they stand in connection to the dominions that Daniel explained to King Nebuchadnezzar would be serving themselves of Israel's land. Uh, we'll see that. Keep in mind, he told them he should be considering the vision in light of the time periods he was now being given. By holding up the statue and the various components of that statue with the beast dominions, Israel was given a time period for the dominions that would be serving themselves of the land. This is important for people who understand, want to understand prophecy. That 49 year time period was directly related to the second beast, the lion, Medo-Persia. That 49 year time period fits them. Looking back in history, we can see that that 49 year time period relates to the time of Ezra, Nehemiah, and Esther in your Bible. A time when the Medo-Persian kingdom was the dominant force in the land. 
Gabriel began by saying, from the going forth of the commandment to restore and rebuild Jerusalem. When did that directive take place? Well, it took place three different times in your Bible. Uh, so uh, determining the exact precision, the, with, with precision, the exact announcement to begin that 49 years, it's kind of up in the air. And then people put dates according to those three times. But for the purposes of our study, all we need to know at this point is that after the initial pouring of the fifth bucket of wrath, the initial contents of that wrath, the 70-year captivity had been fulfilled. And we come to Cyrus, king of Persia, beast number two. And this statement in Ezra, chapter 1, verses 1 and 2. Now in the first year of Cyrus, king of Persia, that the word of the Lord by the mouth of Jeremiah might be fulfilled, the Lord stirred up the spirit of Cyrus, king of Persia, that he made a proclamation throughout all his kingdom and put that proclamation in writing, saying this in verses 2 and 3. Thus saith Cyrus, king of Persia, the Lord God of heaven hath given me all the kingdoms of the earth, and he hath charged me to build him an house at Jerusalem, which is in Judah. Who is there among you of all, all, all his people? His God be with him, and let him go up to Jerusalem, which is in Judah, and build the house of the Lord God of Israel. He is the God, which is in Jerusalem. So the people of the nation were permitted to return to their land and redirected to, re, or directed to rebuild their temple by Cyrus. But that's quite a different return from the return that will take place when Christ returns in the air and sends the angelic host to regather all of the elect from the four corners of the earth to Jerusalem. Uh, that will be believing Israel in time yet future. What would happen after that 49 years were up? Well, we'll look at the answer to that in our, in our next lesson. We'll go to the next time period uh, that was given to Daniel by Gabriel, the 432 years. How much of that has already played itself out and how much remains still sitting in that bucket to be fulfilled? We'll look at that in our next lesson.